I apologize for the delay. It just means there's going to be more thunder in less time. All right, if you're prepared for it, are you prepared? Yeah. Okay, because we're talking about something serious that I've been so nervous about talking to you all about because it has the word fail in it. <laughs> and Pizza Expo asked me to do this presentation. They said, oh, do you want to come and speak again this year? And I said, yeah, you give me the title and then I'll fill in the blanks. And then they gave me something that I thought might get me beat up. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I have a lot to talk about with all of you and I'm really excited about it. Uh, first of all, my name's Scott. I, I know a lot of people in the room, but I don't know everybody in the room. So the first thing I want to do is introduce myself and explain what I do and why it is that I'm here to talk to you about how I see pizzerias fail, which is the title here, the very difficult title Pizza Expo gave me. And the main thing I can tell you about what I do is I, I do not own a pizzeria. I do not operate a pizzeria. I do not manage a pizzeria. I don't technically work in a pizzeria. I kind of do, but none of them pay me. So I guess I don't work in a pizzeria. Um, but what I do is that I am a professional pizza consumer. And that's not a joke. Uh, my parents maybe think it might be, but it's not a joke. And when I say that I'm a professional pizza consumer, when I say that, um, what it means is, well, I spend, let's see, in 2018, um, myself, my company, really, I run a company called Scott's Pizza Tours in New York, where we take people on tours of significant pizzerias all around the city. And we do our best to teach people about the differences between different pizza styles and to let them understand a bit more about what's going on in your world. So we're kind of the intermediate between the pizza producers and the pizza consumers. So that's why we, are, we see ourselves as professional pizza consumers, because in 2018, we spent over $200,000 in independent pizzerias in New York City. And that's awesome. That's what we do. We, uh, we buy pizza at pizzerias, and we try to explain to our best abilities what's going on behind the scenes. Because we know that the pizza world is growing right now. I thought when I started doing this almost 11 years ago, I thought that, wow, there's so much pizza stuff to talk about. This is great. I had no idea that now, almost 11 years later, we're in a time that I really think is a pizza golden age, and it's even getting better right now. There are more styles, there's more variety, there are more people going to events like this, like the Pizza Expo, and the Pizza Expo has branched out in ways that it wasn't doing 10, 11, 12 years ago. And so with all that combined in the same time, I really feel like there's so much to talk about uh, with regard to what's going on in the pizza world, and unlike a lot of the other seminars that are happening over the next few days, what I'm here to talk about is from a different perspective. It's the perspective of the consumer, because that's what I am. I don't pretend to be an operator. I don't see myself as one. I operate a business, but I'm not making pizza for a living. I'm teaching people and giving them an experience to help them understand what you do. That's what I do for a living. And the bottom line with all this is that I visit pizzerias, and my team takes people to different pizzerias, and all along the way, we're trying to get people to understand what you're doing because at the end of the day, it's not something like we're going around reviewing. We're not telling you, oh, this is bad and this is good. We have a rule where when we visit a pizzeria, we're not allowed to talk about the food until after we've left. Because I want people to be honest with their opinion. I don't know if you've ever had the experience with, oh, how was your food? Oh, everything was great, thanks. And then you see the review from that person a week later. Everything was terrible. The manager was so rude at the moment that you asked them how their food was. We try to get in the way of that. We're sort of, the way I explain it to pizzeria operators, is we're sort of like if you got to walk down the street with your customer after they leave your restaurant, and when they're all talking about what they just ate, we're there to be like, yeah, but actually they were trying to do that, so it's okay. That's what we do. I mean, the bottom line is that we're rooting for you. Like, we are on the side of pizzerias. We're trying to explain these things. So in discussing this with you this afternoon, I want to go through four basic components of the run and buildup of a pizzeria and talk about where we see pizzerias sometimes falling short. So I want to let you know my goals for what we're going to talk about. The first stage of the whole thing is coming up with the concept. So I want to talk about how some pizzerias run into trouble when even in that concept phase. How many people in this room are in a concept phase right now planning to open a pizzeria? Awesome. Great. We can, we can fix so much right now. 
Uh, how many people own a pizzeria? You've had it for years and everything. How many people are in the process of expanding what you already have? Probably a lot of those same people. Great, good, because the next stage is the development stage, which everybody is constantly in, at least we hope. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about the execution stage. So in actually running the restaurant, how do we see things that sometimes fall short? And then finally, of course, is the expansion stage, which should cover pretty much everybody in the room. And I want to run through these stages and explain just a couple little examples of how I see pizzerias having common uh, mistakes, common moments where they fall short. And then after that, I want to save some time if anybody has questions about things, because one major part of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is I want to keep everything with example-based, where it's broad enough that hopefully it should make sense to everybody. And then later on, we can get into my personal pet peeves, which I will address because I have a room full of you right now. It's okay, don't worry, it's not that bad. They're not that bad. Seriously, again, I'm rooting for you. It's all okay. So first phase, the concept phase, which when you're designing what your restaurant will be, this is probably the most exciting phase for you because it's the dream phase. It's figuring out what is it that I want to do? Where am I going to go with this? And it's the most important thing because if you mess up at this moment, then everything else is going to be messed up. This is the foundation. And so just when I started running my business, taking people around to pizzerias, I made a few decisions about what I wanted to be. I wanted to be very positive. I wanted to be all about education. I wanted to be open to everybody. And this way, along the way, any decision that I made had to fall in line with those few concepts. So I imagine that's the same thing with you. That's what you're all doing. When I, when I visit a pizzeria, it's pretty clear right away if they have the concept figured out. And again, that's the first thing. So I want to talk a little bit about a pizzeria that I visited recently that I'm going to keep all these pizzerias anonymous. I blackened out information about them. Don't, don't zoom in too much. Don't read that parking sign. That might figure it out. But listen, it's not, it's not in New York. It's not even in the United States. It's not in the Western Hemisphere. A pizzeria I visited that they knew when, even when they asked me to come out and visit them, they knew that some things were kind of out of whack. And I knew right away when we pulled into the parking lot and I see signs that just explain great value, world-class pizza, very general things. They don't tell me anything about what it is that they're going to do or what they're trying to be, which is really tough because this pizzeria in particular is not in a neighborhood. It doesn't have foot traffic. You won't know by looking through the window. You'll be in a car when you're passing by. And so I knew right away, okay, some things maybe were not totally figured out right off the bat. And the concept is really big. Part of my issue with a, a place like this and not having a, an idea of what their concept is, is that if you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have the foot traffic, I would hope that that means that you're creating something of a destination. So you've thought about it in advance. You're making yourself a destination that people will get to without having to walk straight by. And that was kind of problematic because this place did not have a strong identity. And that became even clearer when walking inside, I don't know if you can see this very well, but uh, this is becoming pretty common lately where pizzerias are doing multiple styles with multiple ovens. How many people do multiple styles with multiple ovens in the room? Cool, how many multiple styles with one oven type? Cool, well this place has, they've got an electric deck oven all the way on the left of the photo, and then toward the right, they've got this big, beautiful, golden wood fired oven. And it was very exciting because I had seen pictures before I showed up. I knew what the pizza was like, but I'd only seen one style of pizza in the photos. And so I asked right away, oh, well, what about, I see one style that I'm, uh, you know, it clearly was coming from that electric oven. What about the other oven? And that's when they told me that they don't use the other oven. Yeah, so I said, well, okay, so well, is something wrong? What happened? They put it in the wrong place. Somebody forgot and said, no, we just got that because it looks cool. Right. I mean, would anybody in here get an oven just because it looks cool? If it's your, I mean, come on. Yeah, I, I don't, anyway, anyway, as it turns out, it was because it was a partnership. And this is a whole thing that we don't need to really dig into. You, I'm going to assume you know that you know, forming a partnership with people who don't have the same vision as you is a bad idea. I'm assuming that you know that, okay? That's what happened here. Somebody said, well, when you walk into this place, it doesn't read pizzeria. And to the partner, one of the partners, 
the thing that would read pizzeria was having a big golden oven in the center, even though they were selling themselves as a New York style pizzeria. So the vision was not direct. They did not have an agreed upon concept. Had they had an agreed upon concept, they would have known, oh, well, wait a second, we're a New York style pizzeria, why would we have this kind of oven? We're making assumptions about customers that were probably inaccurate, which is that you need to walk inside a place that has no foot traffic outside, by the way. You're expecting people to drive by and see the golden oven, you know, 50 feet off the street, and then that maybe lure them in. This, it was a shaky concept right away. So that oven that's right off to the side, completely not being used at all, okay? Now, this became a major, major problem, especially because that one partner who pulled that decision ended up leaving the company one month after opening. So major, major problem. As soon as that partner left, suddenly they realized that the concept was not a formed concept. Had they had a formed concept that they agreed upon, they could have avoided things like this, and they could have avoided things like which they had to do next was a total rebranding because the concept's name was tied to the partner who left instead of being tied to the concept. So we're in this very important phase which clearly had a bunch of issues and they ended up having to totally rebrand the place and they're, by the way, they're okay with this going up. I asked them about it. And they even put the word rebranding right on the big poster just so everybody knew very clearly that this was a place that was being totally changed because they had made decisions in the concept phase that didn't make sense. Now, there was another pizzeria that was a little closer to home for me, it does not exist anymore, so there's the, sorry about the spoiler, but they're not around anymore. This was a place that's in, it had to be 700 square foot space on a pretty popular street, tons of foot traffic, and the oven that they had in this spot, it's hard to see from this weird sniper photo I took years and years ago, but wood-burning oven built into the, into the space because it had been a pizzeria before, and this company that took over decided, okay, we're going to use this oven, and they had two ideas for a concept. And luckily, I, I talked to them a little bit about it before they opened. Their first concept was, we're going to sell gigantic slices of pizza. Great idea, okay. It's New York, people love pizza by the slice, people love those giant over-the-top slices that fit on two plates. It's, you walk down the street with one of those and you get a few blocks away and you're still eating it, it's great. The problem was they're using a wood-burning oven and they didn't think about it until we talked about it, that the oven could not fit a large pizza in it. It's a 20-inch 20 20 inch opening. They said, we're gonna do a 26-inch pizza. They hadn't, <laughs> right? I don't need to do the math for everybody. It's too big. Anyway, but it's okay because we got to talk about that before they opened and that meant that they were able to change the concept. Then they changed the concept and they said, no, we got this wood-fired oven. We're going to make this a great sit-down pizzeria. We're going to do the small format Neapolitan, neo-Neapolitan pizzas and it's going to be great. The problem is, remember the square footage I told you? <laughs> yeah, it's tiny. You can't, you can't do that. You, Nobody's going to sit in there for very long, and yeah, certainly not enough tables to be able to make some money, which is why, again, the concept phase kind of totally got shifted out of proportion. So I want to mention something just while we're along the way, because I, I'm giving you information that I kind of figure out as a consumer, but I do not figure all this stuff out by myself. I talk to a lot of people who are trainers and educators in the industry, and one of, without a doubt, my absolute favorite people in the world gave me an amazing piece of advice for these pizzerias when I talked to him about stories like this. You may know John Arena from Metro Pizza, right here in Las Vegas. John, when I talked to him about this just a week or two ago, and I was saying, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I want to make sure I give advice to this room full of operators, and me, as a person who's not an operator, what is going to happen? I want to make sure to give some good advice. And he put it into a sentence, the very thing that I was already going to tell everybody, which is, do the math. If you have a concept that you think will work, but you haven't done the math, then you don't know if it will work. And why put all the investment into a place on a main street with tons of foot traffic that makes you sit down to eat the food when you only have enough room for four or five tables? Pretty clear. It wasn't going to work out. That's why the place closed. It was within six months. So that first stage, 
was so critically important. And in both of those cases, uh, the operators missed the point and, and didn't figure things out going in. So without a doubt, I think the most important stage, and it's where I as a consumer can see really quickly if there was a, a clear vision. I know a lot of people in this room whose pizzerias I've been to, you walk into them and there's a clear vision. And when somebody tells me, oh, I love such and such pizzeria, and I say, well, what is it that you like about that place? Why do you go there? And when they can tell me in a quick sentence, something beyond just the food, I assume they like the food. But when they can say, oh, because that is the place that I love going, that's a Sunday evening, the night before the work week starts, and that's where I feel centered, then like, oh, okay, cool, that's a thing. That's very different from, oh, it's where I can go before I see a movie and grab a quick slice. It's a totally different concept. So that brings us into the second stage, the, the development stage, which is a stage that I've been able to observe more closely over the past 11 years, 12 years or so, as I've been running these tours and doing all these other things within the pizza world. I've gotten to know a lot of operators and, and getting advice from them about what happens in this stage is really, really interesting to me. Stuff that I'd never really thought about and stuff that I try to explain to my guests on tours, what's gonna happen in the background of a pizzeria, which all starts off with staff and with training and with hiring. And this is a thing that I never thought much about because I would go to a pizzeria and the pizza's good or the pizza's bad and that's kind of whatever it is. If you go back the next day and maybe it's different from that first day that you went, it's a clear sign that something was going on in the background that maybe was a little off with training. And I talk to a lot of operators who give me really interesting tidbits, like a look into their world, which is uh, a, a really good friend, Roberto Capruccio, who has Keste and Don Antonio in New York, told me really early on, it must have been nine or ten years ago, he says that he doesn't like to hire pizza makers. And then, and talking to other pizzerias, I see there's kind of a trend, especially with the style that Roberto makes, which is Neapolitan, where the dough is very soft and it has to be opened very carefully, and Roberto sort of has to give this version of it because he's a trainer. And so if somebody goes into his pizzeria and doesn't eat that exact pizza, it reflects poorly on his whole world. So he doesn't like to hire pizza makers because he finds that they come in with experiences that don't lend well to making that style. And so people who already work in the restaurant, dishwashers or even servers sometimes, they become pizza makers because he's able to train them from the ground up. And I think that it's such a, such a cool way to go about it because especially with this style of pizza, it's so intricate and detailed that if you approach it with sort of like a, oh, I've been doing this 20 years, I can get this covered, and then there's a whole mess. That's why when I go to pizzerias on tours, every once in a while, there's a new pizza maker, and I see the way that they open the dough, and I notice that, oh, this is a new person. They're not opening it the way that they were taught, or maybe they weren't trained at all, and suddenly they're making a different pizza. And if I go to a pizzeria telling my guests this is a Neapolitan pizzeria. They're going to open the dough very gently. It will never be lifted above their elbow. It certainly will not be launched in the air. And then suddenly I see a pizza maker do those things, then all bets are off. It's out of the concept and it's out of the style. And so the training kind of becomes a major issue which most consumers won't see. They'll only see the product. That's what I try to explain is what's going on before they even see the product. Now, Another uh, uh, pizza maker and, and uh, trainer and international pizza consultant, Anthony Falco, uh, gave me some great advice about all this when I, I was asking him a couple weeks ago about training because recently he was in Asia doing some trainings and um, it was amazing to, I got to watch some of the, the training he was doing and it's really incredible because there are moments where I see him making pizza, moments I see other people making pizza and then moments that I see the interaction between the two. And he, he reminded me of this one major piece of advice that he always tries to lend to his, his, uh, his clients, which is that uh, you don't want to learn just a recipe. You want to learn a method. And I heard Peter Reinhardt talk about this earlier today, a little bit in his seminar that he gave about the quest for the perfect pizza. He was talking about the difference between good pizza and great pizza, and how great pizza, you can you can tell that the person who made it really cared. And I'm kind of tired of the whole, you know, like when people say, oh, the secret ingredient in my pizza is love, fine. But you know what I mean? Like, no, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's that you actually care about the process. And that's why it's interesting to me to see when a pizza maker knows why they do the thing they do, 
the pizza is better. It's not a coincidence that so many people here are some of the best pizza makers on the planet. It's because you care about the thing that you're doing. And it's not just as simple as, oh, I can take a dough from a ball into a thing and put some stuff on it and bake it. It's not that. It's, it's that you understand why the process happens. The best pizza maker is not the pizza maker who can make a couple of pies one day. It's the pizza maker who can, in all the changes that are happening in the environment, continuously make great pizzas. I think actually that there's a, um, I think it's a Chris Bianco quote. Maybe he'll say it tomorrow at the keynote. But I think Chris Bianco said, I can teach a monkey to make one good pizza, but you really have to know what you're doing to make thousands of great pizzas when the environment's always changing. And it's so incredible. Otherwise, you're in a situation where you teach somebody to push a piece of dough into a little aluminum pan that has a little trench around the outside to make the cornicione. And then this is, it's not going to end up as a good pizza. Because the, the person knows, oh, I have to stretch the dough. They're not thinking what's happening in that stretch. When we do these tours and we tell people, we put a piece of dough in their hands. My favorite thing to do is we'll take a piece of dough put it into somebody's hand, and then you know instantly what they'll do if, they're, if they've never made pizza really before, or if they've made pizza at home but have failed. This is the thing I always ask, has anybody made pizza? And everyone says, oh, I tried, but you know, obviously it, it, it didn't stretch right. So and it's because as soon as I put it in that person's hand, they squeeze the hell out of it. You know what I mean? Which is, which is like that's, that's a human reaction. Of course I want to squeeze the hell out of it. But it's because they don't understand how pizza is made. That the dough, when it's stretched, is, is not to be thought of as a dough stretching. It's to be thought of as the air inside the dough being displaced and rerouted. So I'm not moving the dough. I'm, not, I'm moving the air within it. And if you think about it like that, then suddenly you have a greater respect for the air that you've built up over uh, the hours or days of fermentation that you've given that dough. And once somebody on a pizza tour who's never made pizza professionally and maybe just thought that they were going to get to eat some pizza and then go home, now suddenly realizes that there's way more going on. So that's why understanding the process is such a big deal. If your staff can't answer the question about why you do a thing that you do, then it's a great opportunity to be able to tell them more about it. Oh, well, this is why we do that. So the problem will come in that if maybe you've trained somebody and maybe they missed the point of dough stretching or uh, tomato application. If they are part of training another staff member, then suddenly you've lost another generation. It's like making Xerox copies. If you make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, it's never going to be like the original. But if you understand what that image should be, then absolutely you can do it. Which brings us into the execution phase. This is where things get really, really interesting because this is where normal customers really see the action. The everyday process of what's going on. So the execution phase, to me, is really interesting because this is the kind of thing that, as a customer, I depend on a place to making the pizza the way that they made it last week. And this is why I show up either on a tour or just in normal life. And I want to bring up uh, another great trainer, Andrew Scudero from Goodfellas in Staten Island. Uh, he runs the, the New York Pizza School where they do one-on-one -on -one trainings for pizza makers, for professionals. Uh, maybe somebody in this room has gone through trainings with him, but he's told me all these really amazing tidbits from when he trains pizzerias. And one of them that stuck out to me probably more than any other one was um, he runs into this issue where, okay, people learn how to stretch, they understand topping and baking, they can work an oven, fine. But something I never really thought about was the opening day where he's told me that so many people who he's, he has trained on opening day were not prepared for how busy they were going to be. They tried to undersell themselves and think of themselves as being, oh, well, we'll ramp up. We'll have a soft opening. And he's telling me examples of not, not people opening in New York where there's an expectation for pizza and there's before you open, people are already talking about how bad your pizza probably is. You know, it's cutthroat. But he's talking about places all across the country. And and he, he told me about, he tries to tell everybody he trains to don't underestimate yourself. Because he's had so many situations where they'll make, okay, we're going to make 250 doughs. If we sell 250 pizzas on our opening day, that would be insane. And then, you know, there are 400 people show up and it's a major problem. So right now, remember this. 
And I can tell you this as a, on the consumer side, pizza is crazy popular and it's getting more popular and people are more interested in it because there's so much media out there covering it that the problem is if you operate the way that people were operating 15, 20 years ago, where it's just, okay, it's almost like a commodity food, then you miss the whole point. Now you got to kind of run a little faster because people's education or at least their perceived education about pizza is way beyond. It's wild. 10 years ago, I'd have people on a tour and the questions would be, what's the best pizza? Oh, what's the most important part of the crust, the sauce, the cheese? You know, they were, they were fine questions. Now, people say, what's better for New York style, cold fermentation or low yeast and long room temperature fermentation? And I'm like, first of all, can you come on every tour? Because that's an awesome question. But also, people weren't asking that to me 10 years ago. So it's amazing to see where their heads are, and that should give you a clue of where you need to be. That if you're not thinking about all that, then, then you might be missing the ball in it. So that probably the easiest thing for me to talk about today as a consumer, and that you all have to know this, is the idea of consistency. And this is probably the biggest thing that happens on a tour when I have to explain to people why on Tuesdays, we always go to this certain pizzeria that's on Carmine Street because Tuesdays I know Ruben is making the pizza. And then they say, well, what? Does that mean it's bad on the other days? And I say, no, I just really like you more on Tuesdays. And to them, it seems like, oh, that's a really cute little fun fact. And then to me, I realize, oh, wait a second. I just kind of accidentally told them that the other days are not good. That's not what I meant to say. But it means that the, the staff members are all making pizza slightly differently, which could be a major problem. The picture I put up for you are... Two of the same pizza made at the same pizzeria on the same day. And they're not at all the same. Don't worry if you can't see it in the back. I'll describe it to you. One of them looks awesome. One of them looks like garbage. <laughs> now, this was on a tour. And it was funny. Like It was kind of part of a little experiment. But uh, I asked people to try both of them and to tell me what they preferred. And they actually liked the one that kind of looked like garbage to me which taught, taught me a couple lessons. It taught me that, first of all, I can't make an assumption about what somebody else is going to like. That was a big one. I, I, I was really blown away by that. But also that a pizzeria that can put out two pizzas that are so completely different on the same day is, is, has some major problems. Consistency is the reason that people will come back. Oh, I love to go there because I know what I'm going to get. I expect it to be like this, and I know it's going to deliver what I want it to be. I bring my friends there because I know what it's going to be. I bring a pizza tour there because I can depend on it. So if there's a pizzeria that we visit on a tour and then suddenly we're, we stop visiting there and then they ask me, hey, what happened? That's where we have to talk about, well, it wasn't coming out quite the same and I figured we'd stop for a minute and see what happens. And, and if things like this happen, the inconsistency is like definitely the biggest thing. Now, I mentioned before something about that I think we're really in or entering a golden age of pizza. And part of that is because there's so many styles. The styles that we didn't know even existed. Now, people on a tour the other day just asked me, oh, well, what are some other styles besides Neapolitan and New York style? And then I go down the list. You know, New Haven, Detroit, St. Louis style, California style, Roman pizza, Altaglio, Roman pizza, Tonda. Like, uh, we just keep going. And they're like, I didn't... It's like finding out that the alphabet has 300 letters, and we like, we just been playing with 26. We didn't know about the other ones. That's to me is so interesting. But the problem is that sometimes I see pizzerias opening, and they open with the concept. They know what the concept's going to be. They figured we're going to do it in the right space. Nothing else is a mistake. But then the problem is that they make this pizza, and people don't get it. So, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where. I mean, I'm in this situation every day. I bring people to a pizzeria, and we feed them the pizza that we feed them, and then we explain to them what that pizzeria is trying to achieve. This is great because it's like they're in free fall, but we're sort of like catching them in a nice gentle net of information, you know, where they might be like, oh, this is really floppy. And then we say, oh, well, that's because it's baked in such a hot oven at a high temperature. And historically, here's why that existed. And then they understand it, and then they're cool with it. But you don't get that option. You don't have that opportunity every time. So the problem that I see happening is sometimes pizzerias are afraid to listen to their guests, which is crazy to me. They're so stuck in this is what we're going to do. 
This is how we're going to do it, and you're going to like it. If you want that to happen, you would have to pick up education in some way. You got to do something at the table or on a menu to explain to your guests what's going on, or you have to adapt. And that's why I think a major problem is when pizzerias refuse to make those changes to adapt. Because it's really hard to change what the public thinks, but I really believe in making the tweaks so that the pizza is right for the people you're selling it to. Because, and I hope this is the case, I hope that you don't own a pizzeria just because you really wanted to make and give out pizza. You probably want to make money on it and sell it for money, right? For the money. I mean, that's part of it. I know you love it, but you have to be able to pay people and pay the rent and everything. Like, this all has to happen. And if you don't adapt, then that's a major issue. We see Neapolitan pizzerias, high temperature ovens, really fast bake, floppy, sometimes a little soggy in the center. It's, a, it's such a tiny little bullseye to hit that it's so hard to hit that if you're off by a little bit, it's not only is it not very good, but it means that it's not really that style anymore. That's why the Neapolitan thing got really, really popular. And then now, it's, over the past five, six, seven years, it's transformed into this other thing where we're seeing pizzas that are the same size, the same shape, baked in similar ovens, but a little bit lower temperature, a little bit longer bake, not soft and soggy. They're crispy. They're the way that Americans like to eat pizza for the most part. That word crispy comes up a lot. Hey, what pizza do you like? Well, I like it to be crispy, and that's always what I get. It's very rare that I hear people say, I want it to be soft. That doesn't mean they don't like it. It just means they don't understand it. So luckily on a tour, we can kind of open up the door for them, and then they love the soft pizza. They love a Neapolitan pizza. But that crispy pizza is really, really picks up for a lot of people. I just think that the, the kind of refusal to adapt becomes a big issue because the people who are going to buy your food are not buying it. You have to change something. You have to change them or you have to change the food. One of them is easier than the other. You know, figure it out. But, you know, uh, another person I want to bring up uh, for the advice, especially within this category, uh, another great pizza maker based in Chicago is Leo Spitzeri. And Leo is going to, he's at the show. He's doing, I saw his schedule the other day. I think he's doing 10,000 different demos. It's insane. But he reminded me of something that, again, as a consumer, I don't see this part. I don't see what goes on as much behind the scenes. I'm not your manager sitting and ordering product for the week or for the month. And he, talk, he told me about that some of the inconsistency and some of the refusal to adapt sometimes becomes a financial issue where a pizzeria is are so often paying too much for ingredients. And this is, I got a crazy education from him about this because I'm not an operator. And, you know, in my world, I guess I think about, well, you don't just have one distributor, or at least I would hope you don't just have one distributor, because then you're kind of stuck in that distributor's world. So he told me about his advice he gives to all of his clients that come through his trainings, which is that he always tells them, to make a list of your main essential items that you use every day and then shop around at three or four restaurant suppliers, uh, supply shops and then deal with it that way, which is, sounds great to me because it means that then suddenly you're, you don't have to deal with cutting corners. Like it's, this question came up last week on a tour, something about, oh, well, how are these pizzerias able to charge such little money? There was a, you know, New York has all these dollar slice places and the dollar slice is not just making the same pizza and charging less. It's making a different pizza. It's its own genre. And it's interesting because that genre is based on the price, that number. So it means that to be able to make the pizza and sell it for that price, you can't be paying more than what you're selling it for to make any money. So as the rents go up, which they do, and as cheese goes up and down, which it does, and flour, the same thing, to be able to stabilize, you have to be kind of nimble. So they do. They, they don't stick to just one distributor all the time. And Leo reminded me of that, which is part of the whole puzzle of that thing. Now, in that mode, in the execution mode of running the restaurant, the major thing that is, I feel like every time I'm at one of these events, I always hear people talk about this, and I hope that it sticks, but unfortunately, in in the world of watching so many pizzerias, especially from afar, 
it's clear that not everything in social media has become really clear to everybody. So while I am not at all about to lecture anybody about that they need to post seven times a day or whatever it is, I can definitely give some input from the consumer side about how I see your posts coming up, which gets a little crazy. I'm shocked to this day that I still see stock photos of pizza on pizzeria posts. Don't, Albert, don't take a picture of that. I don't want that on anybody's devices. This is a stock photo of pizza, and it's like, I, I, I can pick the top five that I see everywhere. Every time I see one, knowing that this is a stock photo makes me think your pizzeria is awful. Because number one, it doesn't even look that good. Number two, it, I'm shocked that people who carry around, everyone has a camera on them right now, you probably have two or three, that we still see these stock photos. So please, and I'm sorry if you posted this yesterday and if I took this off your Instagram feed, but, but please don't, don't, just don't, no more stock photos. Because it's so easy to take a photo yourself, you know? Even, like, even if, you know, just, just throwing a camera on a pizza, it's okay. Look, this, this is not a great looking pizza either. But it can so easily become a great looking pizza. And I'm gonna give you like the quickest tutorial on this I can. I don't wanna lecture anybody because I'm not a great photographer, but I don't post stock photos, so that's good. Look, you take a pizza and you drag it by the window and with some natural lighting, and you get real close, real sexy. Just snap a little photo with the phone, you know? Like that, I'm into it. I wanna be in that. It's just a pizza by the window. I took this like two or three days ago. It's just, it looks so good. This, but okay, that's daylight, right? At night, things get a little tougher. And I read some article recently about restaurants designing themselves so that customers could take Instagram photos more easily, that to me sounds insane. You don't have to do that. Because people who wanna post up a photo, figure out a way to do it. Uh, I have a little trick that I, I wanna teach you about taking photos in restaurants that have kind of funky lighting where you can't, you, you get some shadows and you know, I do not advocate for these crazy bright flashes or you know the thing where people bring in the big light, like the big lamp? That's, I don't know. That messes up the whole vibe, doesn't it? I guess it depends on the pizzeria. but. I've got a little trick that I teach people on tours that I think is not so intrusive on the rest of the restaurant. You take one of the plates from the table, they're usually a white plate or like an off-white plate, and then you hold it up in the air and you bounce your phone's flashlight off of it. And then if you angle the plate right, you'll get it so that it's like just a gentle glow. You know what I mean? And no crazy shadows or anything. And then that person feels good, you can tag them. You could do it in the, your restaurant, it's fine. This was awesome. That pizza, I ate that thing, that pizza was awesome. But it looked, it looked good too. I mean, this is a major thing that I just am so surprised when I see the bad photos on, uh, on Instagram. Instagram is a visual medium. On Twitter, you can write, I just made a great pizza, come and try it, nobody will know. On Instagram, it's only the photo. That's all you got. So, uh, another thing I wanna mention about social media stuff, which is again something that I would like hope that doesn't need to be brought up all that much, which is that you have a business Instagram for your pizzeria. Please don't use that to post things that would be on a personal Instagram. You see it all the time. Paulie, you're different because you just post about all the food that you eat, which is awesome. That's you. I love it. But don't post political stuff. You know what I mean? Like I don't need to say that, but people do. Look, I, black, I, I blanked out who this is. Somebody posts a thing about that's basically trying to tell people, oh, you know, you should just shoot people who you think are going to break into your place. That's terrifying. That's what your pizzeria is posting? Where's the pizza? Put up a stock photo for at least, you know? I just, I was shocked to see something like this. And then, you know, there, there's even like a little thing on there that says the name of the person who created the image. And you look at what that is, and that's not something you want to be posting about on your restaurant. Your person will do whatever you want to do. But I just couldn't believe it when I see stuff like this. I didn't want to show you like the dozens of samples I found over the past year because uh, it's just really annoying not to scrub all the names off it. But like, please don't do that. Um, the next thing which is important about the social media is that it's become a major problem recently where people are making their pizza specifically for social media. And that can be real dangerous. It could be good and it could be bad. So I want to bring up Mike. So Mike runs Tony Bologna's in Hoboken. He's awesome. 
His place is awesome, and he totally makes gimmicky pizzas that do really great on Instagram and get all these videos and millions and millions of views, and that's cool, but it comes with major, major problems. So I was talking to him maybe a month ago about he was doing a pizza bagel, but it was a giant pizza bagel, okay? He teamed up with a local bagel, bagel maker. They would make these huge bagels, and then he would pizzify them. Great. Problem is, it was terrible. Okay, and this is his, his words. I never had it. His words. He had this giant pizza bagel. People would come in for it. They would order a slice of it, and then they're totally disappointed because, as it turns out, a giant bagel is not very good. <laughs> and putting some pizza stuff on it just makes it more of a mess. He found that he was getting into trouble because he was making this thing that the execution of the food was letting down customers who came all the way out of their way for it. So while it seemed like a good idea because you get all this attention, millions of views on these insider videos and whatever they are, but then people show up and it's not that solid. Although he found a way to work with this. So he makes a lot of funky, I hate to use the word gimmick because it's not just a gimmick. Like I've eaten a lot of these pizzas and they are, we'll call them, what's that word? Um, where it's a funny, weird thing. Quirky, I like it, we'll stick with that. Quirky pies, QPs. So, he's really good at making QPs. But, it's really hard to make like the one he's holding up in this picture is a ramen pizza. It's like a ramen noodle base. It's got 20 different spices on top, it's insane. But, it takes a long time to make. If you wanna order one of these, you gotta order it a day in advance. So he decided, I'm only gonna make those on Wednesdays. Wednesday is the day for that. Tuesday is the day for the taco pizza that's got 30 handmade tortillas on tacos, like amazing pizza. He's pulled it down to specific days because he learned the hard way that if you start doing things, people will actually want to eat them. And if he has a 250 foot square, uh, square foot kitchen, okay, that he's trying to do all these crazy quirky pizzas out of, and that's novelty was the word I was looking for, novelty pizzas. Yeah, maybe that's worse. Let's stick with QPs. But anyway, he's making these funky pizzas uh, and he kind of painted himself into a corner which got a little, a little tough for him. So, we definitely got to talk about reviews because this is a thing that I dread and I hate looking at reviews. To look at reviews of my business is always tough. I got to hold my breath and like go for it. But we got to talk about it because I use review sites, but I don't write on review sites. And I, a major thing to think about is that the people who are using the review sites are not all the people who are writing on the review sites. So you might think, oh, I hate these people who write these reviews, they're awful, they don't tell me there's a problem, then they go home and they write this awful review. Yeah, but they're not the only ones using the site. There are other people reading the reviews and that's where writing the responses to them becomes really important. You're not really just writing to that person, you're writing to everybody else. You have, there's like a little interaction that suddenly you're like, oh, but no, it was your fault. You know, I wanna show you a couple examples just to kind of walk you through what I see as somebody who uses review sites as a way to just kind of check on what's going on or even just find the address to a place. This stuff all comes up. So one review that came up that I saw was somebody's, somebody's oh, they write this whole thing, it really all comes down to one word, disappointment. They were disappointed. This covers a ton of the reviews that you might get that are negative. Somebody's disappointed, fine. You may not know the reason, uh, maybe they've, like, this person spelled it out really, really clearly. But the problem is in the response. So the response to this one was actually started off pretty okay, where the pizzeria apologized. They say, I'm sorry. Sorry, it wasn't such a good experience. Uh, but then they go into talking about, they, they kind of push the blame onto the reviewer. They write in this, in this answer, hey, these, you know, problems happen. We want everybody to have a good experience. The best thing to do is you should tell somebody when you're in the restaurant, and which is absolutely, absolutely true. But it's a little bit like parenting. Like it, it, comes, off, it comes off badly. Like I kind of wish that this reviewer sort of left it alone. So clearly the person who wrote that whole thing is just whining. The people who read these sites are smarter than the people who write on them. Okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna say that. Blaming the person who wrote it they're, well, I don't care if they like it or not, but everybody else is going to be like, ah, oh, why do you got to shift the blame? At least that's what, I, that's what I do. You know, this other review I found was an interesting one, uh, which is, you know, the, the whole thing that they're arguing about in the entire review all has to do with that it's overpriced. Okay, no problem. 
They're complaining about it. It's a New York style place. I think they said something like, I'm from New York and this is crazy. Boycott the place. And then, oh, and then I think somewhere within there they used, they misused the word literally. Oh, no, no, no. I guess it's accurate. I'm, they say I'm literally from New York. That's, that's fine. But the problem is that in the response, they, pull, they pick on the use of the word literally, and it becomes a whole thing and a price breakdown and the whole thing. And, and really, the person who wrote that review, when I read that review, I was like, oh, this person's nuts. I don't need to deal with That's fine. Yeah, pizza costs what it costs. You know that going in. It's not, like, it's not like you say, yeah, I'll buy that pizza, and then they say, a month later, you get a bill like the doctor. You know what I mean? This, that's why I feel like this response is just unnecessary. You know? I know some experts maybe say that, oh, you should write, write a response to every review. I actually think reviews like that are fine left alone. Let that person burn their own ship. You know what I mean? It's fine. Like, people who read it are smarter than the people writing on it. Then, this is an interesting one. Oh, great pizza, but somebody was, you know, uh, your staff member was annoying. They were rude and all that. Okay, fine. Uh, when, if I read that, I'm not too offended by a rude staff member. They had a bad day. I'm fine with that. But here's where a response happened. And this response is so awesome because look at this. They're, first of all, thanking the person for writing the review. That happened two reviews ago. And then they're saying, they're reminding everybody else reading. They're like, well, we're really glad that you liked it, which is the thing that you said in your review that you liked it. That's cool to remind everybody that they like the food. They say that they're apologizing of it and that they appreciate that they took the time to write the review and that they're going to address it. So this is awesome. This is, this is, it's not saying, oh, you're wrong. It's not blaming the person. It's not saying, you know what? Come in for a free pizza. We'll make it all better. No, it's saying, thank you for the feedback. We're going to address this, which I thought was awesome. I didn't need to see a response to that one, but we got one. What a great gift. Next step in the final step, the final phase, is the expansion phase, which I just want to touch on lightly. It's only because in conversations I've had with pizza makers recently, I've heard some really interesting things, which, again, I hadn't thought about so much. When I go to a second or third or fourth location on a tour or just a normal life, the thought is always, is it as good as the first? Is it the same as the first? Just last week, a new pizzeria opened up in New York. I haven't been to it yet. A couple of tour guides I worked with had been, and they said, oh, this is good, but this is different, and this is different. Going back to the whole consistency thing, the problem is that you know, not every location provides the same opportunity. So I actually got a great, a great conversation with Laura Meyer, uh, who runs all the culinary for Tony Gemignani's pizzerias. Laura Meyer, I've never seen anyone like her making different styles all simultaneously in different ovens. It's absolutely unbelievable to watch. And now, with her position with Tony and his restaurants, She's checking on uh, over a dozen restaurants that are all dealing with different issues, different size walk-in, different space for service. And that's where she, she told me this thing that she's really learned a lot, which is that the next location is not just a carbon copy. And what she was talking about is really about the food itself. So the pizzeria that just opened up in New York, the next location, one thing that they told me about was that, oh, well, our fermentation process is different at this location. And it turns out it's because they don't have the same square footage as the other one. They don't have as much walk-in space. So they had to make it work for what they have. When Roberto Capruccio opened Caste on Bleecker Street, he didn't have any room for a walk-in. So he developed a dough that doesn't, that it's at ambient temperature all the time. It's in a little closet with an air conditioner on. Those things are really interesting because when he opened up another place that had room for that, he made decisions about how to tweak his dough based on that secondary room. So, you know, the, this idea of uh, like opening up n other places and letting the changes happen and not, not just trying to do the exact same thing, it, doing the exact same thing has gotten people into trouble, uh, at least, you know, in, in talking to Laura about it for sure. Um, oh, yeah, I want to I wanna bring up one, one last thing from uh, Andrew Scudera, who we, we heard from before from uh, Goodfellas in Staten Island. And this is a really interesting thing that he said about when pizzerias start in their startup phase, which I know a lot of you are going to be in soon, and you're spending all this money and putting in all this investment, you hired a consultant who hopefully you listen to, you train people, hopefully you're training the right people and training them thoroughly, you're doing your social media with your actual photos, and, and you're marketing the heck out of it. And he, he told me, 
great line about uh, he sees so many pizzerias cut their marketing as the first thing to chop if they realize they're spending too much money. And he sees that they've built up all this momentum, and once marketing is cut, that's when things kind of go off the rails. Because if people don't know about you, then what, who are you making pizza for? Yourself? I mean, that, I'm okay with that, but it doesn't really pay the bills. So before we kind of wrap up and then open up, if anybody has any questions about any of this, I do want to take this opportunity with a room full of pizzeria operators to go through some of my pet peeves. <laughs> just a couple, I'll make them real brief. Just little minor, these are not big picture pet, these are not big operational things. These are my little quibbles that I'm just personally asking you about, which number one, please don't give me raw, thick cut, uncooked tomatoes on a pizza. It's hard to see this, but this picture is a nightmare picture. Just got these slices, like huge slices of tomatoes covering this whole pizza. It was kind of bad, but don't worry about that. The real big things are this. Number one, on your website, please don't hide your information, your details, your hours, your, your where are you located. I can't tell you how many times I go to a, a website, and I want to go to your website. I don't want to just like go through the Yelp listings or something. I want to go to your website, scroll down to the bottom, see the information there. And I've seen so many times where it's hidden or I can't find it at all. I don't even know where you are. Even worse is that it's a name of a pizzeria that is so common that I don't know which one this is on this website. So ask somebody who's never been on your website. Say, hey, go to my website and tell me my address. And if they can't tell you within 10 seconds, then you gotta fix something. Because yeah, it's great when I see this Motorino's website, it's really, really easy. You click on the location you want. It's got hours and location in the same spot. Because when I go to the website, I'm looking for where are you, when are you open, how do I order the pizza? Those are the main things I'm looking for. Menu is after that. But, you know, let's say I, I, I know the menu or I, I know you make pizza. How hard could it be? This is the stuff that I think is really interesting is that the hours in the location, just really, really short, you know? Make it easy. Next step, next pet peeve. I just addressed it slightly. When you're opening your pizzeria and you're in the concept phase, pick a name that's not boring, please. Mainly because when I search it online or I search it on Instagram, or I want to be able to make sure it's the right one. If you tell me, oh yeah, the name of my, my pizzeria is called Bellinopoly, and I go look at it on Instagram, there's 10,000 of them. It's so hard. And it doesn't say as part of the handle where you're located. So I'm just begging, please. Don't, you know, if you're going to name your pizzeria, Make sure that nobody else has it. That'll be good. Also, because what if it's a great success and you're going to franchise? Then suddenly you got to run into these other people who use the name. Just make it easier for yourself. Also, this is, I was in a place three weeks ago. Oh my God, you're taking pictures of this? It's terrible. This was visible. There's a visible mess in this, in this place. It was, a, it was a slice shop, and I just was surprised about this. Again, like pet peeve when I bring people into a pizzeria on a tour, and then, and the first thing they see is that, then, like, they don't even have to eat the pizza. They already are having a bad time. I brought people into a kitchen once. We do kitchen tours. And then, you know, there's a garbage in the kitchen. And they were offended that the garbage was in the garbage can. If they can be offended at something being where it should be, imagine seeing this kind of crazy mess sitting out. Last thing I really want to hit up, and this is, this is my heart and soul, is pizza slicing. The, the thing that I maybe necessarily or unnecessarily freak out about a pizzeria is I just want to give you my personal guide of the way I think pizzas are best sliced, okay? It's going to sound insane, but I've just watched, I watch people eat pizza for a living, like, and I see what happens when things fall apart. If you got a 10 to 12 inch pizza, just give me four, okay? Because if it's too small and you try to pick it up, everything falls apart, and then it's a mess for everybody. You know, 12 to 14 inches, you can get into that six slice range. That's okay. Because when you, again, when you pick up the slice and you try to fold it, this still gives you some good ability for it. Now, I see this all the time. I see it all the time. And it, usually it's my fault because I say, oh, can you slice it? I know you usually do six. Can you put it in a four? And I see that they do the one down the equator, and then they go for the second slice of the six cut, and then they're like, oh, I'm done now. It's four. <laughs> you know, try to... And then I got to explain to somebody on a tour why they got the big slice and they got a small slice because I don't want to be the guy who's always like, well, this one's cut wrong. Can you redo it? Like, I don't want to do that. I do it, but I really don't want that. That's not my world I want to be in. Those bigger pies, definitely. Eight cut is totally cool. 
But the reason that I bring all this stuff up is that I feel like sometimes pizzerias are not putting themselves in the seat of their customer, which is when you see people lift up a, a fast-baked Neapolitan pizza, it's been a 12-inch pie cut into eight slices, and they pick it up and everything falls apart. Their first complaint is, oh, everything fell apart and it was too soft and floppy. The reason that a New York slice works and is eaten in that way is that it's a big pie. When you take a crust and you lift them up to the point where the, the, the edge becomes stable, this is when you change the slice's moment of inertia. And it's an important physical concept that doesn't work when you have an eight cut 12 inch pie because that moment of inertia does not change because you have such a soft center of the pie. It's really, it's just really like a major thing. And I kind of feel like this is maybe controversial, but I feel like when people eat a pizza in a pizzeria, especially in New York or most, mostly around the US, we expect to be, eaten, be eating it by the slice. So our mental vision of pizza is that we're picking it up and eating it by the slice. But in Naples, the pizza is served uncut. And the reason for that is that it's softer pizza. And when you navigate it with a fork and knife by yourself, you're able to put it into a size and shape that's going to work for you. So by serving somebody a sliced pizza that's made in a style that's not intentionally sliced historically, you're asking people to eat it out of context. And I think that's where people have this disconnect. I, it's sliced, so I expect it to work fine, but it doesn't. So I maybe suggest, if possible, if you serve a pizza unsliced and make the customer slice it themselves, then they won't be, hopefully, won't be mad at you for slicing it in a way that's soft for them. I think it, they take on some of it. And definitely in delivery for this style of pizza, I feel like it's it's crazy to slice a Neapolitan pizza before it gets delivered because it just turns into mush when it's on the way. By serving it unsliced, I think it's a great opportunity to also give people a little plastic slicer with the name of your pizzeria on it and everything. They're so cute. I love them. I love them.